Good evening. <laughs> Professor Peter Doherty, AC, and Mrs. Penny Doherty, Dr. John O'Hagan and his family, who are here from many parts of the country, Professor Carol Mumford, Director of the Translational Research Institute, uh, fellows and members of the Academy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Graham Baker, the current president of the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to the inaugural John O'Hagan Lecture. Uh, before I continue, I should like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet tonight and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, my introduction will be brief because there's a person here you all want to hear from, but let me just say a few remarks, if I may, about the Academy and why we had this lecture tonight. Uh, the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences exists to promote scholarship in all branches of the arts and sciences, Importantly, to disseminate latest advances to the wider community as much as we can, and very relevant to tonight's talk, I think you will find, to stimulate discussion on evidence based social and public policy. In that light, the Academy decided a little while ago to establish an annual lecture open to all members of the public who are interested, uh, to be delivered each year by a luminary on a subject of their choosing something they're passionate about and something that they will make a substantial statement on. Uh, the Academy also decided that we would name this annual lecture after Dr. John O'Hagan, who was the founder and first president of our Academy. Uh, John himself has had a long career uh, in biochemistry and medical research uh, at universities, CSIRO, in fact here in the PA hospital grounds long before this one facility was open. In fact, John gave me tonight, if I may, because I won't be able to read it all or remember it, he gave me a newspaper cutting taken from the Courier, 1962, where it announces the first major grant for medical research uh, from the National Heart Foundation was awarded to Queenslanders, one of whom was Dr. John O'Hagan, who received a princely sum of £3,226 in 1962 to enable them to carry out study on blood cells and responses to injury in the brain. Uh, John's uh, history in this field is therefore very long and quite prestigious and we're delighted uh, to name this lecture after him. Uh, John, for those who know him, also would know that he's, had a, he's been a driving force behind the World Society of Queensland. Uh, he was instrumental in the formation of Queensland Museum Act some time ago and of course in establishing our academy. But we should say, John, and he doesn't mind my saying, is 95 years old, he's sitting right there. Give him a clap. <laughs> of course, ladies and gentlemen, as you would all be aware, events like this can only be mounted through the generosity of sponsors. And uh, we've been very fortunate tonight and I would like to thank our major sponsors for tonight's function. Firstly, and the logos are largely on the overhead slide, largely our gold sponsors, the University of Queensland through the Provost Office, the Translational Research Institute, whose facilities we're in this evening, and we also have major sponsorship from the Queensland over the Australian National Fabrication Facility and the CSIRO Health and Biosecurity Group. And I will just add one small thing, also the Create Foundation, who have printed off a number of copies of tonight's lecture, and some of these will be available for anyone who's interested on the way up the door. Uh, it will also be posted on our website, so please don't be alarmed if you aren't able to get a hard copy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, the person we're really here to see. Uh, the phrase, the cliche, tonight's speaker needs little introduction, may well have been invented for tonight's speaker, but I'll say a few words anyway if I may. Peter Charles Doherty was born here in Brisbane a little while ago in the last century. He's only slightly younger than me, but not much. He attended Indrapilly High School and the University of Queensland, where he graduated with a degree in veterinary science before moving on to be a veterinary officer with the then named Queensland Department of Agriculture and Stock. After a few years, he and his wife Penny were also delighted to welcome Penny here this evening, a microbiologist, and she tells me she also worked here at the PA Hospital uh, a few years ago as well. Uh, they travelled off to Scotland and Peter gained his PhD from the University of Edinburgh Medical School. Uh, Peter subsequently has held uh, appointments at the John Curtin School of Medical Research, 
the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, and very importantly, at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Professor Doherty's research is mainly in the area of defense against viruses, and as you probably all know very well, in light of his very significant contributions in that field, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1996 in physiology or medicine, jointly with Swiss colleague Professor Rolf Zinkenau. For their discovery of how the immune system recognizes virus infected cells. I might add that Peter's very proud to say he's the first person with a veteran qualification to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, long may there be many more. Uh, Professor Dougherty holds many academic honours. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences of the Royal Society of London, the most world's most prestigious scientific academy. He is, a, he is a companion of the Order of Australia and in 1997 was named Australian of the Year. Since then, he's been commuting, he says, between St. Jude's in Memphis and the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Melbourne. Among his many public engagements, he's found time to write a number of books, uh, including uh, A Light History of Hot Air, uh, The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize, <laughs> you should have read that more closely, <laughs> And most recently, The Knowledge Wars, and I will just remind those who didn't notice in the reception, uh, copies of The Knowledge Wars are on sale here tonight outside by a bookseller, and Peter's very happy to sign a copy, you should be buying one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all, and I'd like to see so many uh, new faces, as well as friendly and older faces here tonight. Uh, but I should now say, it's my pleasure to welcome, uh, to deliver tonight's Academy inaugural John O'Hagan lecture titled The Science of Australia. Please welcome Peter Dutch. tribute to John and to the people who work with him that we have so many people here this evening. Because it's the idea of an academy of arts and sciences that draws people together, brings people in to hear different types of things from what one normally encounters, I think is a great one. Um, there's only one academy I know of, big national academies where the, the literary, for instance, and the scientific come together, and that's in the Academy Francaise. Uh, at one end of the building are the sciences, and at the other end is the literary, and they meet in the middle. Wouldn't that be great? That would be nice. But I don't think we do that in, in Australia, or anywhere else for that matter. Now, this lecture, how many hours have I got? Um, <laughs> when, when did you want me to stop? 35, 40 minutes. 35, 40 minutes, okay, okay. Yeah, because you know, a number of prize winners, especially as they get older, go on and on. <laughs> and um, they can be very tedious indeed. Um, so, where were we? <laughs> yeah, I, this lecture, Graham asked me if I would write it out, which I don't, he'd write something for them because he wants to publish it. And I don't normally do that, and, but I agree because it was John O'Hagan and I think John's just, just a really important guy. So. For him, I did this, uh, but as a result of that, I wrote this about a month ago, and I decided I would actually deliver the lecture that I wrote. Normally, I have PowerPoints up there, and I give a lecture which has very little to do with the PowerPoints, <laughs> but this time, I'm actually going to deliver the lecture, so I may actually read, read some of it. Uh, it was written a month ago, it was before I went overseas. I've been out of touch a bit because we only got back at the weekend, and I was extremely angry when I wrote it. And I was very angry about what was happening with the CSIRO and what we think of as the Earth System Sciences and some of the remarks that were shooting around uh, about, about what was happening then. I'd also been pretty incensed for some time because of what happened under the Arabic Newman administration, not your Newman, Morris Newman. 
the, the idiot that didn't like wind farms. And, um, <laughs> and so I've been, I've been actually fairly pissed off, quite frankly. Um, and and the, the lecture probably reveals that to some extent. But recently, I think, uh, we've heard some much more positive sounds. We've been hearing from our Prime Minister, he, I think, a genuine commitment from the innovation. He's just taken a 1,000 delegates to China. Whether that's really a good idea to take a 1,000 delegates anywhere, I'm kind of dubious, but still, they took a 1,000 people to China talking about innovation, and uh, I think that, I believe that went well. We had a uh, talk on that recently from, uh, or just on, yes, yesterday, really, from someone who was on that uh, trip. And also, from the other side, uh, Bill Shorten, for some time, has been talking a lot about science and innovation in a very positive way. And I hope we're kind of getting a consensus across the political landscape that this is enormously important for us. But I think also that we need to be much more sophisticated in thinking about how we do that. And so uh, I hope those, those themes actually get an area because sometimes uh, things get carried away with rhetoric. My only concern is there are other forces there, particularly in the present government party, uh, which are simply uh, are, are regressive beyond belief. And uh, one always wonders or worries that those political forces could again take control. So my lecture. Um, so I've always been obsessed with the fact that this is such a special place. Australia is such a special place. It's so different and it's so unique. And it's also a fact that this is one of the few countries in the world, one of the few stable democracies, that's had its whole history in the era of modern science. And that's a bit what the book that's outside the knowledge was is about. It's about a book about science for non-scientists or people who don't even like science. But it tells people what it is, how it works, and it gives sort of warts and all view of it, fraud, denial, skepticism, and all that sort of thing. Also tells you how to look at a scientific paper. But science really begins, modern science really begins in the 17th century, and it begins with the thinking of the English philosopher and former Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Francis Bacon. Uh, unlike the Chancellor of the Exchequer we all read about in Hilary Mantel's uh, fact, factual bias novel or whatever it is, uh, he, he didn't lose his head, he actually retained it. But uh, he is really, in a sense, the founder of modern science, as far as the Brits are concerned, at least. Because it was he that, that said that the only real knowledge comes from what you actually look at, examine, measure, and analyze. Real knowledge doesn't come from just getting great ideas about how the world is and then making pronouncements. Of course, we have some people like that in the current cabinet, but um, <laughs> it, um, it doesn't work that way. And I guess. What I would like to see happen in education generally, and that's why I've been writing books like this, is a perception in the broader community and through our education system that evidence is important. And I'm not concerned whether it's scientific evidence or evidence about sales or whatever it is, or whatever evidence, but I would like to think people will not simply fall for rhetoric, and they will not simply be told what to believe, but they will try to find out what the evidence is. Now, that's kind of complex in science, particularly because it's very diverse and there are such uh, specialties and all the rest of it. And in actual fact, uh, in science, those of us who are scientists have to take just about everything on trust. When we write a scientific paper now, when I wrote a scientific paper when I was early in my career, there were two or three people on it. We all understood what was going on. The technologies were really quite simple. The laboratories were quite small. Now, when I write a scientific paper on, say, influenza infection in human bronchial epithelial cells, okay, if I'm part of that paper, we have all sorts of different types of specialist expertise, some of which I can access and some of which I can't, and I'll have different levels of understanding of them. And I won't understand all the technologies, I won't understand everything that's going on, I certainly won't understand the, what we call the systems biology, the modeling studies, exactly the same sort of people, in fact, who do the climate science modeling. Or when they go to the dark side, these modelers, they get hired away from climate science. We hire them into medicine to do systematics of these enormous data sets we now generate with modern technology. 
that tell us all the genes that are expressed, all the proteins that are made. No, this is my lecture, actually, so I'm putting it in And we hire them away from the climate scientists. And the other people who hire the models away from the climate scientists are the big banks and the betting agencies. So you can see we're in good company. Um, so, That's the first digression. How, how many hours? <laughs> so, anyway, what's always impressed me? So, so it is a fantastic time in science, but as a scientist and as an author on a paper, I basically have to trust my colleagues. I have to trust the other people who are on the paper. And that's, of course, the, the knowledge of this book basically looks at science, and it looks at science from the point of view of an insider, in biomedical research, where I am an insider, and it looks at it from the point of view of an outsider in climate science, where I have some interaction with it. I've talked with a lot of the people. I've chaired the uh, Australian Research Council Climate System Science Board. They wanted someone who knew nothing about it and wouldn't interfere. And uh, <laughs> I do a, a number of things like that. They know I'm not very diligent, and I'll never interfere with them, so they put me on the board. And, um, so, so, basically, I trust, say, the climate scientists because I've met these people, I've listened to their seminars, I've listened to them talk. They seem to be a straight up bunch of guys. In fact, uh, straighter than some of the people in the medical area. And, uh, and, and, uh, and very impressive and very bright because they're physicists and, uh, and mathematicians. These are really very, very smart people. And, uh, and so trust is everything in science, which is why fraud in science is always such a betrayal. That's a complete aside, I've got nothing to do with the book. But, um, so it impresses me that from the very outset, Australia was to some extent defined by the scientists. On board the Endeavour, and the Endeavour sailed out here because it was partly an expedition that was partly funded by the Royal Society of London, partly by the Royal Navy. The Royal Society of London wanted to observe the transit of Venus. The Royal Society, by the way, is the, is the, uh, uh, um, the oldest medical academy, uh, scientific academy in the English-speaking world. In fact, probably the oldest scientific academy in the world. Uh, it, is, um, it is also essentially the, the Academy of Science for the, uh, the British Commonwealth, or the British, uh, yeah, the British Commonwealth. Uh, FRS does not stand for former research science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there is some truth in that, uh, because you've got a really senior on poll. So on board the Endeavour, of course, we had Joseph Banks, and we had Daniel Solander, naturalists, they were natural philosophers. The word scientist was not coined until the 19th century. And so they were uh, taking and collecting plants and observing the animals and all the rest of it. And of course, part of the motivation behind the, the expedition uh, on the part of the Navy, for example, on the British government, was first of all trying to claim the territory of what they believed would be their green supposed to be of Australia, and also uh, to see if they could find productive plants like tobacco and, uh, and tomatoes and so forth, were brought back from the New World. And of course, we didn't give them anything like that. And it was really Banks, the, the, um, the, the, the botanist, as we think of him, who later became president of the Royal Society, stayed so long as president of the Royal Society that they changed the rules immediately after he stepped down and limited the term. And uh, it was Banks who pushed the idea of settling Australia and sending the convicts to Australia. They had this enormous problem of uh, accumulating people on hulks because the law had become more tolerant, they had no longer stringing people up, and uh, they, uh, they had to send them somewhere that they couldn't send their human trash to the United States anymore, so they sent them here, and they're our ancestors. And, um, <laughs> and banks really pushed that. So I think then, of course, if you look at 19th century, you have all this activity in science in Australia. And it goes, it's in, it's in Victoria, and it's really quite early in Queensland, a tropical medical health up in the north, very, very, very early on. We had a lot of people indulge, indulging in, in natural sciences uh, right from the outset. Of course, then we had the CSRO starting very early on. Well. So I think we all accept that the science of this country, the science of the land itself, the science of the marine organisms, the science of our plants and animals is our responsibility. It's not solely our responsibility, but if we don't do it, we're really letting ourselves down and we're really letting everybody else down. 
This is not science that, that earns a lot of money, at least in the, not in the short term. The other science that's really ours to do, and I think we must have a big involvement in, is really the science of, of what we call Earth system science. It's the climate science. It's the science of wind and, and oceans and, and the atmosphere and all these things that come into the, the, the broad spectrum of climate science. And that's why I get so angry, because uh, some of the people I've been associating with on the Australia Research Council climate system science thing, they're essentially in despair because they don't, didn't understand how that activity, which was essentially being abolished in, in CSRO as not being a productive activity, uh, would be sustained. Now, it's not quite as bad as that, but we still have no clear definition of what what's happening there. And I think that if we don't do this science, if we don't do this science of the Southern Hemisphere, where we are still the leading players, if we don't do that properly, if we leave it to the taxpayers of other nations, we do that a bit, actually. We tend to uh, leave things to the taxpayers of other nations. Donald Trump will insist we defend ourselves. That would be pretty bad. But if we, if we don't do that science, we're letting ourselves down and we're letting the world down. And if we don't do the science, for instance, that, that our, if we don't contribute our science to the science of Antarctica, for instance, what claim do we have really to say anything about what happens there? We have to be part of the game. I also think if you think of the Asian countries to our north, one of the things in Asian society is they're very respectful of intellectual activity, musical activity. Now, if you, if, if you trap, they, they value our, when our <coughs> orchestras and opera and so forth visit these countries, it's highly valued and it's highly appreciated. We also have a lot of scientific interaction to our north. We have major collaborations in our own group with a group in Shanghai. We did some wonderful stuff with them on the H7N9 flu bikes, which came along recently. Just came out of nowhere, it's killing people. They had wonderful samples, very good clinical records. We were able to get the cells and the, and the fluids and so forth. And we were able to do analyses in Melbourne that they couldn't do. We helped train some of their people. They came backwards and forwards, and this is an ongoing process. So if you think about not just the science of widgets and, and products and all that sort of thing, which is important, and we need to get more activity in that area. But if you think about it, one of the things that earns us respect as being an advanced world nation is our capacity in basic science. And if we lose that, we won't get it back. We'll slide down a very, very slippery pole that we can't climb again. Think about our country. I mean, basically, we do have great strength in financial institutions, though I've heard some slight criticism of the bank recently. But we do have great strength in some of these things because we build up the fortune and all the rest of it. But if we lose that other type of stature and we don't have this, we're basically a commodity producing country. And commodity producing countries in the end analysis don't do all that well. And we don't want that to happen. So it's great that we're now talking about innovation, we're thinking about innovation. But we have to be very subtle about how we do that. This is a magnificent institute. It's an institute that's built to promote innovation and translation. It's an institute that's built to translate discoveries in the medical sciences into practical outcomes. That's all very well. I've been around medical science for too long to remember. And I've seen a lot of this. I've seen hundreds of millions, probably billions of dollars wasted on lousy translation. I've seen people killed because of lousy translation. And the point is that if you don't have good intellectual property, if you don't have really good science to start with, then the translation will go nowhere. It's like uh, Jim Watson, the Nobel Prize winner of Watson and Crick said, that uh, if you don't have the science, you fund cannon builders to put a man on the moon. And really, that doesn't work too well. So I have to find where I am in this, so, because I've totally lost my way. Yep. I think we were all kind of shocked what happened with the, with the Abbott government and the Newman administration, not, not Campbell, Morris Newman. And uh, we were glad to see the back of them. I, I kind of worry, though, that these people are still out there. I worry, I'm very concerned with the fact that in Victoria, for instance, they parachuted to... IPA people uh, into 
a very safe seat. Now, the IPA is basically a, a, a business lobby, but it's also essentially, its political philosophy is libertarian. And the libertarian philosophy is essentially no regulation, no taxes. And if you look at their manifesto, that's exactly what you see. And basically, a society like this cannot prosper if we go down that road. No society does. There's kind of a myth, in, in, I think, in the higher echelons, particularly about political right, that the United States is totally a business-driven culture. Well, let me tell you, that's total nonsense. I mean, the United States is one of the biggest socialist countries in the world. But it's socialism for the rich, and socialism for industry, and socialism for power. They pour enormous amounts of public money into research of, at all sorts of levels. They outspend us on, per head of population on medical research in the National Institutes of Health. They spend a lot more per head of population than we spend in our NHMRC. They outspend us in the National Science Foundation, which is equivalent to our Australian Research Council. They also have other really major agencies that are major research agencies. Um, a couple would be NASA. We're all familiar with NASA. Of course, NASA has a particular job to do. It puts people into space and all the rest of it. But they also do a lot of science and they fund a lot of science. Well, there's also NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. It also puts a lot of money out there in science. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very powerful entity. But apart from that, there's an enormous amount of public money spent under the auspices of defence and energy that funds an enormous amount of research. And in fact, I've heard it said that Silicon Valley owes much of the success actually to energy spending. And that's not acknowledged in the way we approach things. Now, one of the problems we have with Australian funding of science is it goes out in all sorts of different ways. Some of it goes out in very legitimate ways. Uh, I guess CSIRO, though it's a rather too bureaucratic organisation in my mind, far too public service in many of the ways it does things. It goes out through the Australia Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council. They're a pretty good agency. There's a lot of other money that goes out of agency research. But unfortunately, it's locked up in various departments. And the best description of a federal government department for anyone who's ever had anything to do with Canberra is it is a silo. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. And chief scientists. We have one chief scientist. Uh, now, now it's Alan, Alan Finkel. There's a terrific guy. Uh, he's, he's an engineer, he's had real success in commercial activity, in, in, trans in innovation. He, he is an innovator, uh, very well motivated. His wife, Ella Finkel, uh, is the editor of, uh, is a very good journalist, has wrote, written some very extremely nice science-related books on genomics and various things, and also is editing uh, Cosmos magazine, science magazine. So Alan is a terrific guy, but we have one chief scientist, now, if you look at the British government, there is a chief scientist in every major department. The other problem with our chief scientists, and I've heard this said uh, by former chief scientists apart from anyone else, is that you're okay as long as you observe the rules. But if you as a chief scientist, unwittingly, often due to naivety because you don't really understand Canberra, and by the time you do understand Canberra, you may want to shoot yourself. That <laughs> if, that unwittingly, people will cut across the self-interest of the minister or the department. When that happens, they're quietly patted on the head and sidelined. And that actually has happened, has happened to chief scientists. They never actually get to meet in the news. Um, if you think of prime ministers who have been strongly supportive of science, Bob Menzies was, it was a different time, very, very, uh, um, uh, optimistic time, we were building up industry, building up our universities, and of course uh, um, much of that has matured, some of it's been cut out. Um, the other Prime Minister who was actually very supportive of science was John Howard. He actually liked science and would go along to the, um, to the, uh, uh, um, the Prime Minister's science uh, 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 meetings. Um, so, what I worry about for the future of our country is not the type of science that we do in medical research because even Tony Abbott 
was pretty keen on medical research. I mean, it's one thing conservatives are, are clear on, they don't want to die. And, uh, <laughs> George W. Bush put an enormous amount of money into influenza research when he realised that sick people, that the rich people die from influenza. <laughs> it's a pretty big uh, factor. So I'm not worried. Medical research is okay, I think. It a, a, has a strong history of innovation in this country. It's actually a pretty big dollar in, the, in fact for this country through organisations like CSL. We have uh, some very talented and entrepreneurial people. Uh, and I mean, when I was giving talks about this, I, I used to talk about this a lot, and I was very informed on all the details. And you, you list all these these great innovations that have been done in Australia, and the the, 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 the rhetoric would always end with and the bionic ear. <laughs> well, you know, they're getting somewhere with a bionic eye, actually, but they're not quite there yet. So, so we have that whole cheap something. But we've been good in that area. Devices are a good area to be in. And, but I worry about the broader spectrum of science. And I worry particularly about what we think of as the environmental and climate sciences. Climate science comes in for an enormous hit because it cuts across the self-interest of very powerful groups and people. It's very difficult for all of us. I think all of us have a great difficulty dealing with this. Uh, we all think we should be doing something. I think we should be acting. I write about it. I talk about it. And then I get on a plane and fly to America. And you know, that's part of what I do. And yet, we all know that that's, in a sense, is, is really not a sustainable type of activity. So there's that, that, that issue that it's in the gun, if you like, for some extremely powerful people. And if you want to get an idea of that, there's a very good book recently called Dark Money, which is basically about the Koch brothers, who uh, have tremendous oil and coal interests in the United States. One of them stood years ago as a libertarian candidate for election to the US Congress. He didn't get anywhere at all. So what he decided he'd do was buy the Republican Party, which is essentially what he's done. So what you're seeing as you see this absolute insanity that's going on currently in the American political process on the right of the political spectrum is you're seeing this, this tension between people like uh, Cruz and Rubio and all these people who are basically owned by the Koch brothers. And they, they're absolutely dedicated to this libertarian idea. That's the Tea Party idea. No, no government. This is something that Reagan started. But these guys believe very strongly because it suits them extremely well. And then you've got Donald Trump, who's actually the only one who's not controlled by the Koch brothers, and that would, would be better if we have to have some, someone like from that side of the political spectrum. On the, on the Democratic side, it's pretty much politics as usual, except that we have Sanders coming forward, who's actually speaking like a socialist. And that's really unusual for America. I mean, I was once at a hotel in Seattle. Uh, some um, must be 15, 20 years ago, when the American Socialist Party met there, all 23 of them, and, uh, and they were kind of all beardy and sandaly and that sort of people. You know, because the Americans killed all the socialists in the 1930s, or they locked them up uh, under, under, uh, under McCarthy and all the rest of it. So I'm concerned, though, about this, this pushback has really done a lot of damage to various types of science. And one, of course, is the, is the climate science area. And, and also environmental science is often very inconvenient. It stops your real estate development. It stops you bulldozing the forests and all the rest of it. But really, if we think about what our assets are in the long term, we can't rely, obviously, in the really long term on fossil fuels. I mean, these are going to have to be phased out. And I think anyone with any sense realises that. You talk with people at BHP, anywhere you like, the, these big companies understand that that must be the case. Either we have to find a solution to carbon emissions and, and carbon capture and storage, maybe we'll work some places, but it's going to be very expensive no matter how you do it. And, or, and we have to find some alternative income stream from that. So what is our greatest asset? Well, one would have said our greatest asset is the Barrier Reef. But the fact that the Barrier Reef is bleaching, we're not going to stop that happening. This, we could add something to, a, to decreasing emissions, and that might do something to stop the oceans warming. But this is a global problem. 
And if the barrier is going to go, there'll be nothing we can do about it. And it doesn't look all that great at the moment, and we're just at the beginning of this. So, so what, is our, what are our great assets? Well, our assets are the country itself, our people, if we educate them properly, and we give them decent opportunity, and that's enormously important. It's one of the reasons why I keep trying to say we must fund Gonski, because it seems to be the one thing that everyone seemed to be in reasonable <coughs> agreement about. But it's also the land itself. I mean, we should be doing everything possible to protect our remaining beauty spots. I mean, tourism is an enormous potential dollar in it, with such, a, such massive numbers of people to our north who are becoming more and more prosperous and who will be looking for safe and decent places to go. So, so we should not be doing anything that com compromises sites of, of natural beauty. You don't really want to be looking at a coal mine when you're going on a sort of tourist uh, tour. Um, we should be looking so much at our agricultural productivity. Australia should be the greatest country or the greatest uh, uh, research enterprise when it comes to something like dry land farming. It always amazes me that we didn't develop drip irrigation, for instance. We need to look at our selective advantage. And that part of that selective advantage is where we are now. It's, it's basically, if we don't do that science, if we don't keep it up, we will make the wrong decisions. If we don't keep up our water science, water science in Australia has been very, very good. But these are the areas that are really important. <coughs> Earth science, water science, and of course, atmospheric science. We need to keep doing that science. And if we don't, we will make the wrong decisions about things like developing the north in the time of climate change. We need to know what's going on. My goodness, I'm totally lost. <laughs> How much time have we got? Ten minutes? Okay, yeah. I think it's uh, one of the real difficulties in Australia has not necessarily, we, we have a problem that we're, we're too divided. If you want to look, we look too much, I think, to the US as a kind of model of the way we should operate. That's natural enough. They, they, they've been our friends and allies, and of course they saved us during World War II and, and so forth. But I think if we really want to look at a business culture that might suit our type of society better, what we should be looking more to is the model that you see in Europe, in Switzerland, and in Germany, and in, in Scandinavian countries. Uh, that model is, goes back quite a long way. It, it really goes back to the end of the 19th century when the German industry and German universities worked very, very closely together. Really started, I think, with the German dye industry in the medical sciences. And what you have in those countries is you have technical universities that are very high standard, and you have act more academic universities, but they all work very closely together, and they're all of pretty high status. And they're all, by the way, free to, to students in most of these countries. And that nexus between industry and, 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 and academic and research activity is something that we really haven't seen in the building. One of the reasons for that is obvious, is that if you're a businessman, it's much easier uh, to make a lot of money by going out and buying some agricultural land and plonking houses down it or on it or whatever. But somehow or other, we've got to move on from that. And the question is, is how we do that. The other thing that's been lacking often, though, people in the sciences may increasingly want to get into uh, a more technological or industry-based uh, area, it's, it's often very hard to find partners in Australia because of the way the business culture is, and it's often a very difficult road to actually see their way through to how they do it, and they can be very naive about it. Some, some good things are happening. There's a new uh, institute for entrepreneurism, for instance, opening at Ormond College in Melbourne. It's funded by a grant of, I think, something like $10 million, 
and the, the, um, the principal of woman, uh, Rufus Black, who's a young guy, is driving this forward. And maybe that could be some sort of model that tries to bring us more into this situation where industry and science work together. Now, I know many of you will have had experience of that, probably much more experience than I have. We have had big successes, uh, for instance, Gardasil with Ian Fraser and all the rest of it, and of course the bionic ear. But, um, <laughs> I think I've just about covered what I've said, what I've said. So what, what concerns me at the moment is I think our, both our major political parties are kind of thinking in the right way about innovation. I'm not sure they're thinking quite so clearly about science and the role of science. What does concern me is that if the more moderate um, uh, elements in our uh, current government, for example, should, should fail if they're re-elected, and we get a move to the far right again, because I think then we'll get a very, very ideologically driven government that could do a lot of damage. Um, but um, what would we like to see happen? I think with the, the situation with the earth sciences, if you like, that are currently under CSRO, perhaps the problem for the CSRO, which is an old organisation now, it's almost 100 years old, is it basically has conflicting goals. On the one hand, it has an industry-oriented goal, and on the other hand, it has long had the goal of doing the science that's public good. Now, public good science at the moment is not getting a particularly great hearing, uh, especially on the right of the political spectrum. I think, personally, we should stop talking about public good science and start calling it long-term economic good science. I think Don Watson could put that in the next edition of his book, Weasel Words, but it's, um, it's I think, where, where that sort of science makes its contribution. It might be better, particularly with regard to the CSIRO, if that type of Earth system science was taken out of that context and put into something different. We have, for instance, the Antarctic Research organised under the Antarctic Division in Hobart. It's not a division of CSIRO, it's a separate entity. We have the Australian Institute for Marine Science. It was cut under the Abbott government, but it's an extremely important in institution. And of course, we have the science that's ongoing in our university. Part of the approach could be that we transfer that sort of science into the universities, but the only thing I worry about there is, that, is the continuity and the long-term funding. I think a, a, a more definitive structure might be a good thing to have. And maybe what we need is something like an Institute for Earth System Science. I don't think it has to be a, a big building. I think it could be a network of people in different places who all come together under this type of auspice. But I think we must continue to do that science, and we must continue to do that science at a high level, and we must continue to value its insights. I think also something that's interested me recently quite a bit, and I first came across this in a serious way when I read the book, was one of the books before this one, called Sentinel Chickens, which is about birds monitoring the world and so forth, is the power of citizen science. I, with, with online communication systems, with everyone having a mobile phone with a camera, and with many people having some spare time on their hands, there's an enormous potential for actually science coming from the community. Citizen science traditionally has been really the bird watchers. A lot of the activities that people do as bird watchers actually build into environmental science studies. There's no money for that sort of science. So if you're an ornithologist in Australia, you'll probably want to work with an organisation like BirdLife Australia, who will then work with their members, and the data collected by their members will feed back into a proper scientific study. If you've ever sort of been in contact, for instance, with the Backyard Bird Project, where people just record the birds in their backyards, you don't even have to go out. Or if you, uh, in America, they have the, the Christmas bird count, where everyone goes out and counts the birds. Or if you don't want to get frozen, because Christmas is pretty cold in the US, you can be involved in the July butterfly count. <laughs> All this data gets fed back into proper studies and it actually is on, on available to all of us. For instance, the data that 
that's collected by bird watchers in Australia that gets fed in through the back through BirdLife Australia, then goes into the eBird project at Cornell University, where it goes to form an immense database. And that's how we know, for instance, or part of how we know that uh, seabird numbers are down by about half, for example. We know what's happening to bird populations. Not that many people in Australia, so it's much better covered in the Northern Hemisphere than it is in the South. And again, this disparity between the North and the South is one of the reasons we really need to be strong in this type of science. Because as the climate scientists will tell you, we really have much less information about southern wind, weather and water systems than the people in the Northern Hemisphere. We just don't have the concentration of effort. Um, so there are lots of types of citizen science activity around. Uh, I think there's a Morton Bay project where you can sign up to do various things. People can also start their own thing. And I think that's one of the things that I looked at particularly. When I think about trying to get people involved in science or appreciate science or care at all about science, one of the best things that can happen is that people actually start to be involved in it themselves. And so I think citizen science is one of the ways that we need to go. And, uh, and, and to try to get more and more people involved in actually looking at the natural world and appreciating the natural world. And that's, I think, also where the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences has a real role to play. Um, it has a website. I think if someone wants to give some money and they want to actually uh, fund some worthwhile activity through the Academy, one of the things you might think about doing is getting some really bright young guys really to jazz up the website and tie it into all sorts of other things and use it as a focus to bring many things together even if you're just taking people into other areas. So really that's I think it's been a pleasure to deliver the John O'Hagan inaugural lecture in the presence of John O'Hagan and I'm, it's just great to see that it is in such good shape. It's a pleasure to see all of you and thank you for coming along and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have.
community and social media. <coughs> I think it has, it has a part. I think the other thing is blog, blogs, um, uh, good blogs. And of course, the conversation, which I, was, I helped get started. I hope you're all looking at the conversation. Anyone not looking at the conversation? <laughs> is anyone? You, know, you just you just go into um, go into Google, put the conversation one word, edu.au, and then look and see where you can put in your email address, and for free it will deliver content to your inbox every day. Basically, it's a site where academics write thousand-word articles, but instead of the usual incomprehensible twaddle that academics write, it actually goes through a professional newsroom of journals and they make it into something that's accessible and interesting. Uh, not carrying enough science at the moment, I think. Um, Michelle Grattan writes for it. A lot, a lot of the stuff, actually, that you see in various places has been, out, has been taken straight from the conversation because any newspaper wants to contain it. Um, as for the major newspaper chain in Australia, I think uh, you, you can read it for deaths and the <laughs> no, I must say, uh, the, the, the newspaper in that category in Melbourne uh, is called the Herald Sun, and, uh, and people at least in the eastern suburbs who are all uh, uh, liberal voters actually say there's no way we're going to buy in the Herald Sun. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes, I was just wondering what you saw and what role you saw in how you might play in the change of the possible news. I, the the um, nuclear power, uh, there were some of the environmentalists are very positive about nuclear power. Um, Barry Brook in Adelaide, for instance. Um, I heard arguments you know, a decade back uh, from uh, climate scientists we should build nuclear power plants now and agree when we build them to close them down in 50 years. The, apart from the social thing where there's been a trans, I think a tremendous misunderstanding of nuclear power. I think you can do it really quite safely now if you do it properly and uh, with modern technology. But a lot of the problem is really the very long lead time it seems to take to get these things built. And basically the, the difficulties with all sorts of regulatory and compliance issues, particularly in the American states. So we see China going ahead with a substantial number. I think it's 20 or 30 new, new power points on power plants. Uh, Korea also a large number. Um, but I think uh, there are constraints. And of course, the Germans have backed off it. Now, if you talk to the German environmentalists, they will say this is quite irresponsible. It's, it is political. And of course, a lot of European power actually comes from the French nuclear power plants. But it's, it's, it's got its, its issues, but it's not causing a cumulative accumulation in the, in the atmosphere, and uh, it's one of the things we can consider. I think Australia, though, we, we have such an enormous area. We have so much solar input. We have so much other potential with a relatively small population in a big country that we probably can, can avoid uh, going into it. What do you think, Jim? Are you involved in it? Or? Oh, no. Yes. Um, Well, it, it is cleaner in that sense. It is completely clean. Um, there, there, you know, there was an accident at Three Mile Island in the US many years back. And of course, there was also an accident where Teddy Kennedy drove into the little water. And someone drowned, and someone said more. There was a bubble stick that said more people died in Teddy, Teddy Kennedy's car than Three Mile Island. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the current public policy in the context of your lecture, what's the most sensible piece of public policy out there? What's the least sensible? I think you could probably answer that. <laughs> the least sensible. Um, gosh, I, I don't think I'm close enough to the policy details. Actually, I think you know we've heard some ridiculous statements about you know we don't need to do climate science anymore. It's all done from from the guy who's taken over CSRO. But I think he then backed off on that. And then we heard, of course, from Jan, George Brandis that it's not decided anyway. So. But um, in the policy space, I, I don't think I'm really close enough to comment in detail on policy. I, I think, though, we have, to, we have to sustain 
a good investment in basic science in this country. Otherwise, we're going to lose out because you know the sort of science I'm involved in, which has become more and more molecular, and particularly in the cancer areas, going from just a lot of the a lot of what you're doing in a very basic sense can actually lead very quickly to something that can go forward as a possible uh, commercial development. And, and we saw that, I mean, often the lead time is 20 years, it's generally 20 years or so before you translate anything into anything useful. But I think uh, you can't do sort of dull science and expect it's going to lead to innovation. But you also have to have the money, and this is where we've been lacking in, in the past, and this is where I hope the government is thinking. We lack the money for the development. We lack the money to carry things through if you like. Uh, we, we're never going to be able to carry a lot of things through all the way, I think, because we can't come out these enormous trials. And, and I think the case of the Gardasil that was developed here, we won the human pathology virus vaccine. The intellectual property was sold off. Maybe we can do that, no, maybe not. But I'm not really close enough to comment in detail. Do you have any? Well, I, I thought that your, your comment about Australia's sort of comparative advantage of it is in more science than Yes. Well, maybe Yes, but that's exactly the area that's been cut. And it's, been cut. it's been cut not, not simply because it's within the CSRO and the CSRO chief wants to do uh, ahead, wants to do CSRO used to have chiefs. They were all powerful, you know, they had the power of life and death. But, but uh, the, the head of CSRO wants to take it more into the entrepreneurial um, product space. I, I don't think, I don't have a quarrel with him, but I think the other science has to be done. So that's why I think it actually might be better to let him do that or let CSRO redefine itself along those lines and take it somewhere else. So that's no longer, you know, one of the worst things you can have in a new organisation is a conflict of motives, a conflict of roles. And I think CSRO is conflict. Um, also, you know, it needs to invest in your It doesn't have a great reputation as a collaborative. There are probably time for just two more or three questions, I feel. The gentleman at the back, then. Professor Dolly, thank you again so much for the lecture. It's fantastic. And actually, I'd like if you could talk a little bit more about um, the potential uh, problems that you have with the nexus of industry, uh, government, and basic research, and the potential issues for biases, uh, particularly, as you mentioned, a lot of I think, you know, I think government's role, government needs to fund basic science because nobody else is going to fund it. Okay. And it needs to fund a good measure of what, what we call public good science, which I have named long term economic good science. Okay. <laughs> Try to use that term, long term economic good science. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe we can think of a better one. But, um, but I think. The biggest contribution that government can make beyond that is to get the policy settings right about things like tax breaks and, and so forth. You know, the carbon tax was clearly a driving <coughs> innovation, even by some of the people who did their utmost to knock it off and eventually knocked it off. So I think putting a price on carbon is one of the things we really need to do. And I think globally, and, and if you, you read The Economist, in a notorious left-wing rag, The Economist, they think the best policy is the carbon tax. And, and, and we kill them. And I think, uh, um, I think Mr. Abbott's name, if he's remembered in history, will be very bad as a result of that. I think it's the right thing to do. But um, I think that's what government needs to do, because there, there's an enormous capacity for innovation in the community, I think. In, in Melbourne, for instance, I talk to people, engineers and so forth, who are trying to get, keep things going in this sort of renewable energy space. And they found it very difficult because of you know, blocking of wind farms and all sorts of things. These are really talented people. Give them their head and, and put the settings right so that the investment communities and so forth can, can use them. And then you've got innovation. I, I, I'm not in favour of, of government 
trying to run this. Government, I mean, the problem with Canberra, with all governments to some extent, is that there's a philosophy that saying it so makes it so doesn't work. I mean, you've got to get people who, who really are, are inspired to drive things. And if you look at things like Silicon Valley, of course, that's what you've got. That's why I think we, a part of the problem is the type of industry we have. And I'm not attacking the people who are successful business people because that's where the money is. Uh, but we need a different type of, of job. And, and I think if all government can really just get the policies right. Would you agree or do you? Oh, 
20, 30 years ago. That would totally be wrong. No, just awful places. And uh, they've gone, I mean, that, that's long ago. And uh, so I, I, I think a, fle- a kind of flexible structure, but, but with a long term uh, um, uh, um, capacity to it. And, and I think you might have them planted bits of this planet in different university settings, but not controlled by universities. Um, let me tell you, I've worked in private research institutions, private research hospitals, for most of my career in the United States. The ideal relationship with the university is to be next to it and not at this <laughs> <laughs> On that note, on all the ones, would you please thank Professor Peter Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that uh, really brings the formal part of our proceedings to a close, and I personally would like to thank you all for coming here. Uh, Professor Doherty clearly is the main drawcard, and it's wonderful that he's come all this way from Melbourne with Penny uh, to speak with us tonight and speak with all of you. Uh, Just a final couple of comments. Uh, Peter's going to do a brief interview with Steve Austin for AAC Radio, sitting right here. We all know the voice, and there's the face. Uh, uh, After that, if there is still anyone left who really would like Peter to sign a copy of his book, which is still outside, uh, please wait and he'll be around in a moment. Uh, There are also, as we said earlier, uh, printed copies of Peter's lecture tonight on the small table just as you leave the auditorium. If you'd like one, please help yourself. If there aren't enough, please don't worry because we will be publishing this, as Peter himself said, on the Academy website very soon and you can read or download as you wish. Thank you all for coming along. Have a pleasant evening.
you know, we are going to develop this, and we've already had too many of these, that really destroy our greatest business. You used the phrase, selective advantage. Uh, we need to seek our selective advantage. This is one of those areas. What are the areas that are selective advantage? The selective advantage works in different ways. Any successful science takes four counts take advantage of the smart people around you and you work with them, you take advantage of the technology that you command, you take advantage of the resource that you can access. And it might be the resource might be the right hospital where you can access a lot of and find out a lot about a particular tumor. So that's the way scientists think. Successful scientists think in terms of selective advantage. So what are the selective advantages for Australia? Uh, firstly, there's the fact that we are an enormous country with a very small population. It's reasonably well. We need to work on that. We need to, for instance, fund Gong's And we need to fund our public universities properly and not make them inaccessible to kids who don't have enough money. That's the selective advantage of our people and our culture. Then there's the selective advantage of the land itself. And when we're sitting on the biggest solar collector on Earth, God's sake, we have enormous mineral work beyond the fossil fuel. Unfortunately, because of the reality of what's happening in our atmosphere, we're going to have to get out of fossil fuel. I mean, the world is going to have to get out of fossil fuels, and it's going to happen. And, and it will happen, and we've already seen all of the markets in the north as China goes down this road. So we've got that enormous advantage of being able to generate enormous amounts of renewable energy if we organise it. Then we have the selective advantage of our location in the world. We are the most We are still the most powerful scientists. We Even though we only do 3% of the world's science. Yes, but that's quite a lot for a population of 23 million. And really, when you think about it, we're close to Antarctica, we're direct south from the major centre of population growth, which is only about the north of the US. And uh, of course, interaction, we're collaborating a lot to our north now, not just with Europe, we're collaborating with the Asian countries to our north as they interact. We have to be able to hold their head up in that sort of country. And, and the excellence of our science is such that we can do that. But if we don't fund it properly, and we don't fund our basic science properly, which is really the role of us, then we can always go down to the problems and we can't fund it. Now, in your speech, you said a lot of scientists here, look, I'm interpreting long in the United States and the United States and the United States. But you argue we look too much to the US. <laughs> We don't too much as it does. The, the US model of how to do science is really good. And we, we've incorporated in the way our National Health and Medical Research Council operates and our, our Australian Research Council in the way we review grants and help hand out the money to people with the best ideas and who are the most flexible. But if I, we don't, we have, I think, a misconception in our political class about the way the United States operates. The United States is a great business driven culture. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And they have wonderful innovative business. And they have had it for a very long time. And there's a deep building of things like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and the rest of and, and uh, high technology companies. But what is not appreciated by our political companies is that is heavily funded by the American taxpayers. The American taxpayer is much more of their population in medical research than we do. It's much more into uh, organisations like the National Science Foundation. It has ma major other science organisations. But principally, it puts enormous amounts of money into science through defence and energy spending. Uh, I, th I think you said Silicon Valley owes much of its success to energy research. I've been told that. I don't know the actual numbers, but people have said to me that Silicon Valley was heavily funded by energy funding. And so I think we don't think in those terms. And, uh, and of course, when we buy military cars, the money gets spent elsewhere. When the Americans buy military cars, it's all spent in the United States. In your speech, you lamented the, uh, the
influence of the Institute for Public Affairs, and sort of free market think tank, that they're pro-research, they're pro-industry, they're pro-industry, they're not pro-tax, we have to have tax, and we have to have regulation. If you look at, at some of the documentation from the documents the IPA puts out, if they really have public power, they pretty much kill off science. And anything in the public space in this place. I mean, I think of them as being... Sure, wouldn't they just want to privately fund it or fund it through the land? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, that's just not going to happen. I mean, they're fantasists, basically. They're, 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 they've read this terrible book at the stroke by Ayn Rand. They're products of these crappy American business schools. All of them are funded by these, uh, by these big guys like Koshman. I mean, the fantasy is this, and you cut taxes, regulate. It's trickle-down economics. If, if, if it was an invention of the Reagan era, it doesn't work. It never works. The US does a lot for that when there's a lot of public money spent in the, in the public sphere. Now, given what you just told me, then, how do you see the political environment, the IPA, apparently has lots of influence with the conservative side of the politics. So how do you see the political scene ahead of the federal budget that you make? It's not conservative politics. It's, it's, it's military um, extremism. I, I don't think these people are conservative. I mean, conservatives are people who actually want to be I mean, it is true. I mean, you know, the definition of a conservative is a conservative is a person who sees the threat of the latest situation in the past. But if we take Tony Adams, for instance, he was keen to take us back to the past. In fact, I always thought he wanted to take us back to the 14th century because he hadn't really dealt with the Renaissance or the, uh, or the, the Reformation. You said that the major critical parties are, are, are heading the right way about innovation, but not about science. Do you want to clarify? I, I think uh, the Australia Research Council was cut. Um, there's more money going into medical research. I think. They have to keep in mind, and I don't know the, 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 the actual figures in my head. I'm not following that policy area as close as the should. But if you want to get really good science and you want to get really good innovation, you've still got to fund basic science. Because if you're thinking that you take the money out of the basic science, the university type of science, the research type of science, and you put it into downstream science, you, you can only do downstream science well in this country is if you've got something to develop, it's take downstream. So you, you have to do the discovery side, and you have to fund that properly, and you have to get these resources for it. We've done that usually well in the past, but it's becoming an enormous risk. Now we all realise that the country is in a situation where the budgets aren't what they were, and, and there are various reasons for that. And you fall off in mining, there's also the problem, and this is the problem with a lot of the international corporations avoiding tax massively. We have to put that apart and we have to do that with global agreements. But I don't think the right thing to do is to uh, say we're going to cut taxes and that goes to work in the It won't. I mean, if you cut corporate taxes, most of the corporations don't pay that much tax as far as I can see. They must be important. One of the areas I found that really exciting about your speech was what you call citizen science. Yes. Uh, tell me about that. What happens to citizens who are not necessarily scientifically disciplined do citizen science? And how can it benefit you? Well, I think that the obvious example is bird watching. A lot of people who are really avid bird watchers have no scientific training, but they can recognise what they Now, if you're a bird watcher and you want to contribute to science, you should be willing to uh, uh, aware or not. Uh, for instance, if you get involved in the Bird Life Australia Birds in Your Garden project, in America it's called the Backyard Bird Project, basically what you do is you make observations on the birds in your garden and you report them back to the Bird Life Australia. Now that data then goes to an ornithologist to pull all that together and, and you're actually part of a properly designed scientific study. And so there's all sorts of opportunities like that. Many will be filmed that you can go on sort of adventure holidays where you can take turkey. So data yeah. collection. Yeah, data collection and, and recognition. Also, I think it goes beyond that. Some people have really driven things like monitoring of water systems or, or, or waterways and, and form really their own organisation. Earthwatch Australia, for instance, can serve as a focus for that. I think the Morton Bay Authority here has various programs that would be very interesting. Whether if you were, say, passionate about the, uh, the health of Cabbage Tree Creek, and you said, I want to have a Cabbage Tree Creek project, and you 